Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the medicine powers of Native Americans. My guest, Dr. William Lyons, received his doctoral degree in anthropology from the University of Kansas in 1970. Since then, for the last half century, he has sought to understand the sacred ways of traditional American Indian shamans by participating in their ceremonies and teachings. He is the author of the Encyclopedia of Native American Healing, as well as the Encyclopedia of Native American Shamanism. In addition, he has published Black Elk, Sacred Ways of the Lakota, and most recently, Spirit Talkers, North American Indian Medicine Powers. This is an internet interview, and now I will switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for coming on New Thinking Aloud. Thank you for having me. It's a, a real pleasure to talk to you, especially uh, with my own background in parapsychology, having studied some of the most extreme examples of what we would call macro psychokinesis that I could find. And you have a book full of even more extreme examples. <laughs> yeah, I think that book kind of lets you know the parapsychological limits of human beings. They seem to be uh, much further out, much wider and broader than uh, most parapsychologists imagine. And uh, I, I'm just very eager to get into it with you. Well, it's because also, you know, the North American Indians were left untouched until we came here. And it was, so it was only a short time. I mean, we would go out there and meet them and they had been untouched. I guess it's been about 400 years now since North American Indians have been interacting with Europeans. Yes. Yes. And I'm under the impression that uh, some of the early reports, even going back, uh, almost 400 years did there were our accounts from missionaries and, and others of really extraordinary uh, things that they personally witnessed yes yes we have a lot of the book is full of, of uh, accounts that have been witnessed and yet at the same time uh, once anthropologists began studying Native Americans, it seems as if there was almost a taboo, maybe in fact explicitly a taboo against acknowledging uh, what you call the medicine powers. There was, absolutely, and there still is. I think a lot of anthropologists still tell their students that that is primitive superstition, which is not the case. And I had the difficulty publishing the book for that very reason. Nobody, nobody wanted to hear of a book in which someone says magic is real. And that basically, that's, that's what happens. I mean, they call it medicine powers. You call it parapsychology and, and telekinesis and have all these other words for it. But basically, it's the magical ability of human beings. Let's focus in on the word medicine. It, it, it seems like an unusual term to associate with a wide range of shamanistic skills. And uh, it seems uh, a term that is particular to North American Indians. Yes. Yes. It, medicine is something that is beneficial to you. That's basically what it is. And so they had different medicine powers powers that were beneficial to them. And in the earliest times, everybody sought a medicine power. It was, it was normal to have one. So if you were a hunter, you had maybe a medicine power to locate where the game was. If you were a warrior like Crazy Horse, you had a medicine power to make you impervious to bullets and so forth. And then the, medicine men and the medicine women 
were those who had more power than normal. But if you didn't have a power, you were seen as unfortunate. That suggests that the uh, what we might call an animistic worldview was just implicit uh, throughout Native American culture and almost completely erased from uh, Western European American culture. This is true. This is true. It was it was there earlier in Europe. Well, we had a history of burning witches, so uh, clearly when witches were being burned at the stake, we believed that witchcraft was real. But at some point, uh, the, the paradigm shifted and the, the dominant paradigm became, you know, witchcraft is just a superstition. Right. That all happened during the 1800s. Basically, is when, when that came about. And I talk a little about that in my book, how... Uh, the people who were talking about these powers, witnessing these powers, were being accused by all the scientists that they weren't real. Well, they couldn't prove those powers were real. But to prove or disprove or to get rid of a, a phenomenon, you also have to disprove that it exists. The scientists could not disprove those kinds of powers. So they just automatically said they're superstitious. Well, that was illegal, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> you could say it was something like a dirty trick. It was a terrible dirty trick. And they, you know, and it persisted. That was the problem. The public bought it and it persisted. And it's still, you know, embedded in the public. Those of us living here in North America uh, go about our daily lives, uh, those of us who are so-called civilized, uh, with the idea that if psychic powers exist at all, they're very rare and probably have nothing to do with me. And whereas there are at least a million Native Americans who who go through their daily life with a different idea. Right. Right. It's available. It's available to any human being. Now, you very early in your career as a professional anthropologist decided to explore, to learn the sacred ways of Native American shamans by uh, uh, participating with them in their rituals. It was an accident. When I first went, I went, when I graduated, I went to a very small college in Southern Oregon, in Iceland, Oregon. To teach. I was replacing a uh, professor there who had a, just a master's degree, and he went off to get a PhD in anthropology. So when I first got there, I had the courses, I had to do the courses that were on the schedule that he had scheduled. And one of the courses that he scheduled, had scheduled, was a course on North American Indians. I had never taught a course in North American Indians, and I hadn't done a whole lot of study in North American Indians. So that first year was pretty tough on me getting, you know, through that course. But then I got into it, and about two years later, I was uh, in a therapy group. My wife and I were going to a therapy group. It was an ergonomist. He was up in the mountains in Ashland there, and we would go up every week to these therapy groups. Well, there was an Indian in that group named Ernie Rainbow, and he's mentioned as one of the shamans in my book. And one afternoon when we had a break, Ernie and I went out into the woods, and he taught me how to hug trees. And that was really my first introduction to shamanism, was hugging trees. And from there, it just I kept meeting others. About uh, four or five years later, I had a friend come there from, uh, he was from England. His name was Charles Cameron. He came there to teach uh, English for a year to replace a professor who had gone on sabbatical. So he lived in Denver at that time, and he came to Iceland to teach. And he told me when he was there that he knew a, he had met a shaman in Denver named Wallace Black Elk. So I said, very interesting, I'd like to meet him. And so we scheduled 
It was just through a phone conversation and everything for Wallace to come there and do a five-day ceremony at the end of the summer session. That is, when the summer session was over, there was this additional five-day ceremony in which this shaman was going to come do the course with me. I had never met the man. I would heard about him was all. And he showed up in my office 15 minutes before the class began. So the first day we went into the class, and I told the class we would be meeting out in the field for the next four days. That we wouldn't, this wasn't a classroom class. And then Wallace got up and talked about they were going to do an Anippi ceremony, a sweat lodge ceremony. And uh, so there were questions, you know, open to questions. And one young girl asked, uh, Mr. Black Elk, what do we wear to this sweat lodge? And he said, uh, that birthday suit that you were born in. Well, I knew that wasn't really true, but, you know, but the next morning I got a call from the dean. I had to go in and he said, what are you doing running a course where students have to get naked? And I said, no, no, that's not true. That's not really going to happen. They'll, they'll have swimsuits on and towels and that kind of thing. So we started. The next day we went out and it was about, uh, that was on Tuesday and by Thursday, we had the uh, lodge all ready to go. And they lit the fire under the rocks. And I asked Wallace, how long is it going to take to heat these rocks up? And he said, about three hours. And I said, okay, I'm going to go back into the college. I've got some enrollments I have to straighten out still. And I'll be back out within an hour. Well, no sooner had I left than the rangers up on the hill, mountaintop, who were watching for fires, because this was August, doesn't rain in August, you can't have a fire without a permit, they called down to the headquarters and said, do you have a permit for such and such a location? They said, no. So they sent out two rangers to the side. These two rangers drove up in a truck. And what did they see? Well, they saw 30 half-naked students running around in the field. So one ranger said, okay, you stay by the radio and I'll go down. So he came down and he said, uh, uh, can I see your fire permit? No, they asked who was in charge and they pointed to Wallace. And then, then uh, he asked Wallace, may I see your fire permit? And he said, uh, what's that for? And the ranger said, because fires here cause a danger in uh, August because everything's dry. And Wallace replied, oh, no, this sacred fire, no harm come from sacred fire. Well, the ranger, the ranger wasn't going to let him get away with that. So he started pushing on Wallace, telling him he had to go down to the Forest Service headquarters and get a fire permit. Well, the more he pushed on Wallace, the dumber Wallace got. Permit, what that word mean, that kind of stuff. And this guy was getting frustrated and frustrated. And finally, he said, OK, OK, I can write, I'll write you out a temporary permit. Well, he could have done that when he came there. But by this time, it was too late. This black cloud had formed right over the site, no other clouds in the sky at all. And it started to rain really hard, right over the nippy. They had to hold up a tarp for this fellow to write out the permit. It was raining too hard. So the student held up this tarp while he wrote out this fire permit in the rain. And he left quickly, went back and at headquarters, he said, it's been taken care of. That's all he said. He didn't, he didn't tell anybody anything about that. Well, at the end of the year, I put in for a creative course award. Summer school, they ran a session of the most creative course. It won the West Coast Division. So it went to the Nationals, which included Canada, and it won the Nationals. 
So it became the most creative summer school course in 1978. And of course, the dean went back to pick up the award. <laughs> Not me. Because we got that award, they let us have it again the next summer. So we just started continuing. Every summer, we'd have this course where Wallace would come and we'd do a sweat lodge four days out in the field. A couple years later, I started telling them this story for the first time about the rain and coming and so forth. And afterwards, after the class, this woman came up to me and said, that was my husband. I was on the radio when they called down from the mountain and I sent him out there to check it out. And he never told me anything about that. And I said, please, I never talked to him. Please go home and ask him if I could talk to him. She came back in that class session and said, he won't talk to you. So, so for two years, he had never said anything to his wife about this. And when it came up, he still wasn't going to talk to me. So you know he was rather freaked out by it all, I'm sure. Anyway, that's how it all happened. And then Wallace kept coming every year. And finally, about the fifth year, independent of that class, he started a sun dance for white people. Well, that was pretty much taboo. And Russell Means found out about this sun dance going on over there in Ashland, Oregon, for white people that was being formed. So he was going to come over and stop it until he found out that Wallace was running it. Because when they had the occupation of Wounded Knee, Wallace was in there running the sweat lodges. So he was the medicine man at the Wounded Knee occupation. So Russell Means knew better than to go mess with Wallace, and he just let him go. And so they had that every summer. And that thing is still actually going on. After all these years, they still have that Sundance every year. They might not have it this year because of the virus and stuff, but that's basically what happened. So you've participated in the Sundance ritual. I participated one time, just once. I wasn't interested in just doing the whole ritual for four days and... It was at a time that Godfrey Chips had come over there to run it. And we did a night dance. Four nights of night dance. So that was completely different. So there was not piercing in that one. And uh, I never, my interest was not never being a shaman. I just didn't feel a pull. Well, I think it was about uh, five years after meeting Wallace and doing these things, I, I got a call from a student over at the University of Missouri, and uh, he, was, he was having possessions and wanted to know if I could help him or help him understand it. So I said, okay, we'll meet. So we met halfway between uh, there and Kansas City. And... Uh, so, you know, I said, okay, go, you know, go into your trance state or however you do it. So he went into this state and his body started, you know, flipping around in this chair. And it was a chair that you could lean back in, you know, and that comes up and it just went flat and he was just shaking in there. And then the spirit came in and started talking and I recorded all this and <laughs> And the spirit started talking to me and going through, you know, all this stuff with me. And one of the things that he told me was, <clears throat> in your last life, you were a Lakota medicine man named Hollowhorn. Well, that came as a rather surprise because, you know, here I was working with a Lakota medicine man and all of this, you know, and uh, so I looked up Hollowhorn. Well, Hollowhorn had at one time saved the life of Nicholas Black Elk. An ancestor of, of Wallace, I presume. 
Yeah, there's some way related. I don't even know exactly what is the relationship between Nick and Wallace. I do know that that Wallace studied under Nick, but he studied under several other shamans as well. Nick Black Elk, as as I recall, was also the Black Elk of the famous book Black Elk Speaks. Yeah, yes, he was of the book Black Elk Speaks, and um, so Hollowhorn had saved Nick Black Elk's life. So from then on, when people ask me, well, aren't you, you know, wanting to be a shaman? I just say, no, been there, done that <laughs> <laughs> already. So that's kind of how that all came about. So you might say you graduated from being a shaman to being an anthropologist. I guess so. <laughs> who, who studied shamanism. <laughs> now, you've written a book about black elk. I presume that's about Wallace. Yes, that was about Wallace. When I originally had the title, I called it Black Elk Speaks Again. Well, University of Nebraska freaked out at that title. They were going to sue us if we did that title. So I changed it to Black Elk, Sacred Ways of the Lakota. What I should have done is just retitled it to Another Black Elk Speaks. <laughs> but I didn't want to mess with them and, and that kind of stuff. So the book is uh, very unique in the sense that it's all, all the text is taken from recordings of Wallace talking. I don't appear in the book anywhere. Most books that are written on shamans, the author somehow appears also on the book. That's with Lame Deer book and all these other books. You know, the, the author is talking about the shaman. But in this book, it's just the shaman talking, period. I recall you mentioned uh, briefly in, in your book on uh, spirit talkers that uh, in the Black Elk book, he recounts a, a, a UFO encounter. Yes. Yeah. He had uh, several, he had several very, you know, interesting uh, stories in there of, of his abilities. And he, uh, I think, Probably the most profound one that I remember is he had a rancher come to him one time up there in South Dakota who had a bunch of horses stolen as well as saddles and bridles. And this rancher's father had come over earlier for help from Wallace Black Elk and had gotten it. So this rancher asked Wallace if he could help him find his stolen horses. So they set this ceremony up. And during the ceremony, the spirits brought in the saddles and the blankets and the reins right through the ceiling and dropped them into the ceremony room and said, those horses are over there in Rapid City at the stockyard, and that man is going to sell them. So they went over there early before the stockyard opened and found the horses, and they waited till he showed up, and he was arrested. And in the meantime, the, you're saying the saddles and bridles and so on, uh, what uh, psychical researchers would call an apport. They apported into the room. They apported right into the ceremony room without leaving any hole in the ceiling. <laughs> well, this is the sort of thing that uh, it's understandable that most people who hear about it or even who witness this sort of thing aren't going to believe their ears and their eyes. No, nope, no, nope, not until they really go out there and check it out. I mean, I had a hard time believing it also. The first ceremony that I went to with Godfrey Chips up there in South Dakota was a healing ceremony, and a Italian by the name of Marco Redoni, who was a photographer, was living in New York, and he came there for a healing. Four days healing we went through. I went through the ceremony each night, and he had AIDS. And when the ceremony was after four days, he had he didn't have AIDS. He went back and tested; his AIDS were gone, and then the AIDS never reappeared. You know, your book is full of what we would call miraculous accounts of of this sort of thing. Things that would seem to be, uh, you know, by divine intervention, or, or, or they contradict the under the well understood laws of cause and effect that people normally live their lives by. 
Yes, it's a completely it's a completely different level of reality that's coming through there. And yes, it's a it's a divine thing, and these spirit helpers come and help them and do and and cause these things to happen. The uh, Native American worldview, in that sense, is very much akin to the the uh, worldview of spiritualists worldwide. Yeah, well, they they see spirit in everything. Rocks, trees, everything has a spirit. It's just more defined in some than others. Well, we could go on and on, you know, recounting some of the miraculous things you've written about, and 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 I'm sure, and I'm sure we will because they're wonderful stories. But I think to dig a little deeper, uh, one of the interesting. Okay points that you make is that uh, a, a young Native American, even as a child, is going to learn to uh, experience the world differently. And the way you've described it in your book is it's about seeing and thinking with the heart, not with the head. Absolutely. We, As human beings, we have two modes of operation. We can either run our life through the thoughts in our head, or we can Think from our heart. That is, if we go into the heart mode. And the shamans go into the heart mode. That's where it is. It, it's not in the head, but they can use their head mode along with shamans. Shamanism, rather, because you have good shamans and you have bad shamans. I mean, they had shamans who would get you sick and then come around and charge you to be cured. That kind of thing. And the word got around, and they didn't last very long out there in native culture. People, you know, people got onto them real quick and wouldn't have anything to do with them. And, of course, the good shamans, the word got around really good about them. And people would come from miles and miles and miles to be treated. And different shamans had different powers. So you would have to find the shaman who had the particular power to, to uh, heal a broken bone, maybe. Or uh, to cure uh, smallpox, things like this. They had different powers at, at, uh, that were given to them by the helping spirits. Now, Godfrey Chips was different, but we're going to have 16 levels of shamanic power. And he started when he was 13 years old is when he got his first power. And by the time I had met him, he had gone all the way up to the 16th power. So he could do anything. He could cure anybody, any way, any, it didn't matter. And that, of course, is the ultimate. But there's a, there's a catch to that, too. To get to that 16th power, that final vision quest, if you go on a vision quest to get the 16th power, you either get it or they come up and take your dead body away. So, not everybody wants to try for it. <laughs> yeah, I do understand that some of the initiation uh, ceremonies that shamans go through uh, do, in fact, uh, result in death from time to time. Yes, they can. They certainly can. And because uh, it has to do with your heart. If you're not in your heart and you have a lot of bad stuff you've done or whatever, or you're out for that power to to harm people to get it so you can use it for your own advantage, whatever. You can, you can absolutely, you know, have your life taken. One of the things you write about is that there are occasions when Native Americans come together, maybe different tribes will also come together, where the shamans will gather and will, uh, for the benefit of other members of the tribal community, they will demonstrate their powers. Yes, yeah. Then, you know, they would have these power contests, basically, what they were. And the whole tribe, several tribes would gather together to watch these different shamans. And uh, they would stand maybe 20, 30 feet apart and see who could knock each other over, be the first one. Uh, they also had uh, contests like uh, uh, pulling the knot out of a, out of a tree from a distance. Well, that's that's pretty good. Were you powerful enough to pull that knot out of a tree from 20 yards away? So, yes. And then that was like their, their calling cards. 
so the people would know who was the most powerful and so forth. So they they were very interested in knowing that because those powers came and go all the time. And uh, just because you had a power doesn't mean you were going to have it for the rest of your life. And some shamans got powers and, and were told that they could only treat their family. And they never did anything outside the family. So... Uh, Powers would come with restrictions, and you'd have to follow those restrictions. There was dietary restrictions as well that would happen. And uh, if you didn't follow them, you'd lose the power. I understand that uh, in the various tribal communities, they had secret societies uh, within the tribe for, for different uh, shamanistic uh, communities that cultivated uh, particular rituals, particular powers, and uh, uh, and secrecy was also very important as, uh, in, as a part of this, uh, which is, I believe, a reason why many times anthropologists never got to uh, see these things. This is true. This is true. That was <clears throat> your being, it's when you go into those ceremonies, your being affects those ceremonies. And quite often, before a shaman will start a ceremony, he will go around the room and he'll be able to see the doubters there, the people who are just there to, to see what it's all about or whatever. They really don't believe in it. They're really not there to pray for the patient. And, and he'll ask them to leave or she'll ask them to leave the ceremony before the ceremony starts. And, of course, in the secret societies, they already knew. They had a certain, you know, group of people who would come in and do that ceremony. And <clears throat> others in the, in the tribe weren't really interested in knowing about it. They just knew how that worked, that you don't let other people in who aren't really focused on bringing about whatever they're trying to do. Because doubters will will uh, cause cause uh, a ceremony to fail. If you have a doubter in there, that can, that can happen. You, uh, I gather, were uh, able to attend some of these ceremonies. I lucked out. Somehow they, they, they liked me and they knew I wasn't out there to harm them and I believed in what they were doing. And I was invited to many, many ceremonies after I started with Wallace and went on down the line. So I was, in a sense, blessed to be able to go into those ceremonies, for sure. And I've always been very thankful of that. One of the things that you report in your book that I found quite striking is uh, the ability uh, in some of these ceremonies, which take place at night and inside of a lodge or a teepee of some sort, to to create like balls of light. Sometimes I think they were described as as bright as the sun. Yes, they again. <laughs> there's almost no limit to the imagination what you can do with those powers. But I will tell you, there are limits to the powers. And the limit, I think, at least from my point of view, it has to do with mass. How much mass of this movie are you trying to change? And you don't find shamans who are moving mountains. It just doesn't happen. So I ran across a really nice quote from Ramdas, Baba Ramdas. He said, "You know, when you when you have the ability and enough power to move a mountain, you realize you are the one who put the mountain there in the first place. So why move it?" And and I have a feeling there's a limit in shamanism about how much you can do. In fact, is. Healing, sometimes you'll go to a healing and the shaman will tell you, you're too far gone. I can't, I can't heal you. Even though the, he has the power to take out cancer or whatever it is, the patient has waited too long and is too far gone and they can't, they can't save the patient. So there are limits to it. Well, and I suppose to the extent that shamans serve their communities and, and, 
you know, Native American communities across North America suffered from all kinds of oppression at the hands of uh, the European settlers and the United States government broke treaty after treaty and forced them onto reservations with uh, commitments for health care that what weren't delivered and uh, other other things, you know, the uh, whatever shamanistic abilities uh, they had at that time didn't seem to uh, enable them to escape the the terrible oppression that they've suffered. That's that's true. They couldn't uh, uh, they couldn't prevent what the whites were doing to them. For example, when smallpox came along, they had shamans who could who could uh, cure smallpox, but there were so many people that got it. And it's a four-day ceremony to heal it that they, they couldn't keep up. And so a lot of people died. That kind of thing happened. So, yeah, they, they don't influence the minds of the, of the whites to make them do what they want to do. Well, I suppose there's a sense in which they saw their own cultures being decimated uh, at the, the hands of the Europeans. They maybe came to uh, a viewpoint that the uh, Europeans, who were relatively materialistic, had greater magic. Yeah, that's one thing that they, they saw that they, they saw that as a power, as a medicine power also that the whites had, that they couldn't, they couldn't uh, defeat. So to speak, uh, among the Lakota up there in uh, uh, South Dakota, at the turn of the last century, from 1900, around that time, there was one shaman who saved the Lakota shamanistic tradition, and that was a fellow named Horn Chips, and he was Godfrey's grandfather, and he singularly handed save the Lakota sacred traditions, and he got permission to, to conduct the ceremonies. The other ones could get arrested, but for some reason, somehow, he was able to get a legal ability to uh, conduct that ceremony. And it came with a great price to him because <laughs> his spirits had told him that he could never say no. And so when the whites found out about it, they would come up and, and do all sorts of crazy things, have him do all sorts of crazy stuff because he couldn't say no. You know. But uh, he, he persisted and, you know, followed through. His son Ellis became, Godfrey's father became a shaman, and then Godfrey became a shaman. And Godfrey was the seventh in the lineage of shamans, and that's why he had so much power, because four and seven are the sacred numbers. So because he was the seventh generation to become a shaman, he came with a lot of power. Well, when you talk about uh, his, I guess it would be his grandfather or great-grandfather who revived the tradition, you're referring to a period in our, our history. I don't think many Americans understand that at, at one time, the U.S. government forbade the practice of Native American uh, rituals. It was forbidden. Yes, that's, yeah, and that's that's one of the one of the ways they readily stamped it out. Is is you were subject to arrest and jail for for doing a traditional ceremony. This was in the late 1800s, early 1900s it began. Horn Chips, father. And he was called Old Man Chips, is basically. And he was the one who gave Crazy Horse his bulletproof medicine. So, he was a powerful shaman. Crazy Horse was, was regarded as somebody who couldn't be killed by bullets. This is true. He he would go right up and down in, in the front of the line of them. And they would sit there and shoot rifles at him and they never hit him. So, yes. It was quite remarkable and quite frustrating for the Army. <laughs> 
And now today I know they're building a monument to Crazy Horse in South Dakota. Well, that's right. They're carving it out in the mountain, right? That one? Yes, yes. Well, I don't know if that'll ever get finished. It's been going on for a long time. It's a, a big project, but it, it took a while to complete Mount Rushmore as well. That's true. That's true. So we'll see. It'll be nice. I did have the opportunity to visit it. It was very impressive. Oh, did you? Yeah. All right. I have not. I have not seen it. One of the uh, interesting things, as I recall, you reached out to me when you heard me. Uh, talk about something I had witnessed personally in the presence of, of Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic. He was able to take a bean sprout, a mung bean sprout, and hold it in his hand. And in a matter of minutes, in front of eyewitnesses, the bean sprout would sprout and you could watch it. And it dawned on you when you heard that story that this is very much akin to some of the uh, Native American medicine powers. You write about an example where uh, they take a, a corn a kernel and uh, uh, they will sing and chant over the corn kernel until it grows into a complete corn stalk. They go into the kiva. The society goes into the kiva, puts this kernel in a pot, and they sing all night. And as they sing, this corn stalk grows. And it grows completely full, and it puts out ears of corn. And then they take those ears of corn... And that's the corn they plant in their fields. It's sacred corn to them. Horn chips did that too. Horn chips at the turn of the century, he had a 160 acre plot and he would go out and, and plant gourds and you know all sorts of things. And he would pray with each seed he put in the ground. And at, in the fall, there would be wagon loads of Indians come to his farm and take all sorts of food home. Because he would way, way overgrow what he could consume. He was, he was doing it for his people because he knew they were having a hard time getting food. So that was just one of the things that he did for his own people. You also write about uh, a shaman who had a, a fascinating gift. Uh, if he found a dead animal on the ground, he was able to hold that animal and, and revive it. Uh, the animal might run up the hill to the other side of the hill, and then it would drop dead again. Yes. Yeah. They could temporarily reanimate dead animals. Yeah, but the animal wouldn't live forever. You know, it reminds me of uh, at one time I interviewed a uh, an African shaman, Mali Doma Some, uh, from the country of Burkina Faso. And uh, he told me, uh, this is a guy who got his PhD at Oxford, very polished individual, but he had grown up in this shamanistic culture. And he told me he witnessed his grandfather's funeral in the village in Burkina Faso in Africa. And uh, the grandfather was dead, but the uh, villagers got their xylophones together. They're playing on the marimbas or xylophones, uh, a chant. Uh, it animated the body of his grandfather. The grandfather, <laughs> the dead grandfather got up and walked with the c villagers to the graveyard where he was then buried. <laughs> <laughs> that that certainly sounds real to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I have no problem believing in that. Even as fantastic as that may sound to some people, it, that is a definite possibility. And you know, he witnessed it, and the other people witnessed it. So I tend to think so, based on things that I myself have witnessed. That uh, we live in a world where you hear stories like that, and and your assumption is when something that bizarre is, is told it simply couldn't be true. It has to be a lie or a myth or, or a hallucination or some kind of misunderstanding. But it suggests that what we think of as this stable reality we live in is much more flexible than we normally appreciate. Yeah, I think, I think we're in a movie. 
and the movie can be edited by spirits and shamans. So, yes. But it's a, you know, it's a movie with that takes a lot of power to, to put it together as solid. That's called E equals MC squared. <laughs> There's a lot of power in this this solid reality, but it's still a movie. It's still this ongoing, ongoing, ongoing from my point of view. And then these spirits come and just edit the movie. Well, I gather that one of the reasons uh, after so many years of study, you felt comfortable writing your book and talking about the uh, many, many accounts going back hundreds of years from anthropologists and missionaries and others who have witnessed these unbelievable things that uh, what prompted you was being becoming aware of new findings in quantum physics that uh, talked about the uh, role of the observer and the uh, the nature of reality itself not being what uh, we normally come to assume on the basis of classical Newtonian physics. True. That I wasn't really comfortable about writing it until I really started looking at what was going on in quantum mechanics, and in particular. Bell's theorem or Bell's inequality, in which Einstein and Bohr were, you know, going back and forth about is matter and consciousness interrelated. And Bohr said yes, and Einstein said no, it doesn't happen. And finally, Bell's theorem put that to the test, and every test they ran on Bell's theorem, they, you know, kept making the test better and better and better. Every test came back and said, Bohr's right, Einstein's wrong, matter and consciousness are interrelated. And so there, there, to me, the proof is there that this kind of, quote, magic can happen. But, you know, the, the culture is just not uh, attuned to that. They're not taught that in the schools. Now, earlier I had asked you about uh, Wallace Black Elk's UFO encounter, and you told me a fascinating story about the saddles and bridles apporting inside of the uh, room where the ritual was being held. But I am under the impression that throughout uh, North America, Native Americans uh, talk about contact that they have with the space people, things that we associate with UFOs. Uh, it, it's something that they seem to have known about all along in their shamanistic traditions. The problem with that is that they're not going to differentiate between a space alien coming in a vehicle and a spirit being. They, they see these space beings as spirit beings, basically. So... I don't know if they're real and probably are real, but uh, the Indians don't really see them that way or understand them that way. They they just see that they are these spirit beings that come to them. Well, that may be the, a more realistic way of approaching it when you consider that uh, spirit beings have a way of materializing from time to time. Right, right. They they can come in any form. They can they can come in a form and change their form while they're standing right there and you're viewing them. They shape shift right before you. So, you know, it's like they come in a way that is most comfortable for you to accept them in a sense. It's kind of my feeling about it. They don't they don't come and scare you. Well, and you also write about shamans who also have that ability to shape shift. Yes. Yes. That was one of the in fact, I think there's an account in there where a shaman was in Florida was running with uh, four or five others, and they turned themselves into ducks and went across the water. He, they all shape shifted. He, he took them all in this shape shifting thing. So yes, I mean that again is just one of the abilities of being able to edit the movie. Well, I think it's fascinating, especially as a parapsychologist, because, you know, psychical research and parapsychology has a 137-year history since the founding of the Society for Psychical Research in 1882. But many of the experiences that you write about as medicine powers haven't yet been studied by 
psychical researchers. Uh, you know, occasionally they come up like lycanthropy, uh, the idea of uh, taking on the appearance of a wolf. Uh, uh, it, there, there's some records of, of that sort of thing. But uh, if one were to include all these anthropological accounts and uh, accounts from other observers, uh, traders and missionaries and, and so on, we would have a, a much wider spectrum of uh, human possibilities than uh, even the literature of parapsychology and psychical research allows for. I, I think that's absolutely true. I think I think it's much bigger than most people who even study parapsychology believe. It's the the human possibilities are just almost like endless. They're like whatever you can imagine almost. So yes, it's a it's a big field. Based on the strength of your conviction, I have to assume, even though I don't recall reading much in the way of personal accounts of things you yourself have witnessed, I, I expect that you have witnessed a, f a few uh, very dramatic things. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I had one, one kind of funny one was uh, I had this really good friend named Peter, and he, he had been given a protection stone by by uh, Godfrey, and uh, somehow he lost it. So the next time we were up to the reservation together, he asked Godfrey if he could have another protection stone. And Godfrey said, you come over tomorrow morning to the Anippi and meet me over there in the morning. So we went over there in the morning, and he was there, and there was a fireman down there in the and it was a walk down pit, you know, the pit was where the fire pit was maybe uh, seven, eight feet down in the ground. And, and Godfrey says uh, to Peter, he says, you go down there by the fire pit and see that sage. He said, you wad up and get me a big bundle of that sage and make it into a ball and bring it back. And so Peter went down there and uh Got a ball of sage, it was about the size of a softball, came back and handed it to Godfrey. Godfrey took it in his right hand and held it up in the air and started praying. And then he handed it back to Peter and said, it's in the, it's in the uh, sage. And Peter opened that sage and right in the middle of that sage was that stone, a protection stone. And then <laughs> Godfrey said, the next one will cost you four days, meaning he would have to go on a vision quest for four days to get another protection stone if he lost that one. <laughs> the vision quest is a very important ritual, I gather, across many different tribal groups. Right. It, it, it's a quest for help from the spirits is what it is. So when you go on a vision quest, you hope to catch a spirit helper. And they do, you know, many different kinds of vision quests in North America. Uh, usually they'll go up on a mountain and, and uh, set up a little lodge and put a circle of prayer ties around it and so forth. Uh, but sometimes they go on a pit and are buried in a pit. And I did that. I did go through four days of vision questing. One day the first year, two days the second year, three days the third year, and then on the fourth day, I was in a pit for four days. That was very. I was buried in a pit, totally dark for four days without food and water. That was a very interesting experience. I didn't catch a spirit, though, but <laughs> I came out and I was really lit up. <laughs> when they came and got me, they said, my... There's also the light coming out of your eyes. And I said, I feel really good. <laughs> well, when you describe it as being buried, how, like I assume your head wasn't buried in the earth. No, no. They just dig a pit and then they, they put uh, some boards over the top or, and, uh, you know, cover it up so no light comes in from the top. But you have, you know, the full fit for air and things like that. Well, that sounds like a very profound experience. It was. 
it it definitely definitely got me into my heart mode really deep. <laughs> so I came out of there with a lot of joy in my being. And I can feel it. You radiate a lot of joy, Bill. I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't disappointed I didn't catch a spirit. I was just completely, you know, full of joy. Well, it's been a great pleasure uh, with you, William Lyon, uh, sharing your All right. uh, decades you of research. You call me Bill. Okay. I, I will, and I want to encourage our viewers to take a look at your book, Spirit Talkers, Native American Indian Medicine Powers. North American Indian. North American Indian Medicine Powers. I think it would be a wonderful book for our viewers who are interested in Native American culture to dig into. It's one of the finest books I've seen on Native American shamanism, for sure. Especially explicating, you know, eyewitness accounts of what these shamans really can do. Anybody interested in the parapsychological abilities of man and women, that book will, will give you the depth and extent far beyond what, what people think of as of today. So it's a fun read that way. Well, Bill, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it very much. And for those of you viewing, thank you for being with us. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.